Hello everyone, it's Wayne Jones, the Course Coordinator for Australian Employment Law. This is week six, and uh, because there's a fair bit of material in this week and it's divided neatly into two parts, um, I'm going to talk about the material in two separate sections. So uh, the first uh, section from uh, week six in chapter nine deals with um, dispute resolution. Uh, the reading for this week is from chapter 9 and uh, just dealing firstly with dispute resolution that takes us up to around uh, chapter uh, around um, chapter 9.10 and uh, from 9.10 onwards uh, we talk about compliance and enforcement. So to the first part of the chapter then, um, just a, a, an opening comment before I say anything else, you, you're going to see again um, we'll be referring to the Constitution and the constitutional constraints that seem to come up a lot in um, employment law. Um, so uh, be prepared for that. Um, it, it's, the, it's the nature, I think, of employment law that you will constantly bump up against uh, these sorts of restraints um, just because um, it's the, the whole idea of um, uh, dealing with employment law um, at a Commonwealth level in most topics is, uh, is still fairly new. Okay, well, look, what was the old system? Textbook refers to the fact that uh, normally these things were dealt with at the workplace level by uh, a delegate from the union having a conversation with the right people. Sometimes there'd be industrial action, uh, but usually fairly short-lived. And um, I would say that that remains the case, that uh, even where industrial action is taken, generally fairly short-lived. Employers did have an option to take legal action, but again, very rarely did so. There were some famous cases like the Dollar Suites case, um, etc., where um, precedents were established for making claims uh, for damages from unions and participants in illegal um, uh, industrial action, but usually pretty rare. Uh, people instead went off to industrial tribunals for conciliation or arbitration and courts pretty much limited to the individual employment issues um, and, and they eventually included things like uh, health and safety and discrimination. But the new approach is um, twofold. Firstly, there's much stricter controls now on strikes and industrial action and I'd say there's, um, don't leave out there, stricter controls on things like lockouts by the uh, employer. Um, a lot more steps need to be taken before industrial action is protected. And of course, there's much more emphasis on private mediation and arbitration. So you'll see that common thread in this first part where um, Fair Work Commission is really willing and able to undertake um, assistance, but uh, needs the invitation of at least one of the parties. So under the Act, Section 593.3, the Fair Work Commission can deal with a dispute by arbitration, including making any orders it considers appropriate, only if the Commission is expressly authorised to do so under or in accordance with another provision of the Act. So there's no general power to arbitrate. The, the uh, Commission needs to hear from the party who comes to it what's the basis on which the Fair Work Commission has power to arbitrate. The Constitution that I mentioned before and the Boilermakers case, which uh, uh, has a mention in your textbook back in 1956, um, enforces in Australia this concept of um, the separation of powers. And remember from, your, from your, in, your introduction to law course, that meant the, the executive arm, the legislature and the judiciary, they were to be kept uh, separate and apart. And only a court could exercise federal judicial powers. So uh, a court had to be uh, look and feel like a court, so in other words it had to have a judge uh, appointed by the government with tenured appointment. So um, the only example that I could think of that might give you an indication of what they're talking about there is say a Royal Commission might very well employ a judge to uh, undertake the, the commission but the judge is not acting judicially, the judge is acting um, on behalf of the administrative arm in that case. So a judge in a court, but, but uh, the judge has a tenured appointment to be and continue to be a judge in that court. Um, under Fair Work, the Fair Work Commission can resolve disputes and make awards. But 
the federal court is where parties generally turn to to enforce their rights. We'll hear more about that um, in the next lecture. The, the Constitution again, Section 590, uh, Subsection 2 of the Fair Work Act, sets out the powers of the Fair Work Commission to inform itself. Now, the textbook authors are referring here to these because if you look at them, they really look and seem to be the sorts of things that courts do. But um, uh, 590, uh, subsection 2, says that Fair Work can require people to attend, so they can issue attendance notices, uh, invite submissions from parties, order the production of documents, and take evidence on oath. Also note the comment in the text, though, that um, even with all of these trappings of a court, the decisions uh, that are taken by Fair Work Commission aren't binding on a court. So in other words, um, it's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not another court in, in the whole structure of, uh, of Australian courts where you might work out where an appeal happened from the Fair Work Commission. It's just the Commission exercising the powers given to it legislatively under the Act. But, but I think the point's well made that it does a lot of things which look like the powers of a court, and they're very broad and they're discretionary. Again, the sorts of things you'd expect from a court. The private arbitration case, which um, uh, has a mention in the uh, text, decided that when the Fair Work Commission was arbitrating a dispute under a procedure that was set out in an agreement, that it's not acting judicially. It's still exercising a power of private arbitration. So probably an important thing, again, bearing in mind, if I just go back to that again, the sorts of things that the Commission can do, requiring attendances and bite submissions, etc. So it really is looking like a court. It's not coming up with a court decision. It's coming up with a decision of the Commission. But it does allow the Fair Work Commission to determine claims to reinstate or compensate in unfair dismissal cases. So it's the Fair Work Commission that makes those decisions. Um, what else would a court look like? Well, it would allow legal representation so not surprisingly, um, as has always been the case in this area of the law, um, you need to argue for permission to, to be there. Uh, you've probably heard already that in this, uh, in this jurisdiction, um, unions tend to have staff who are um, industrial advocates rather than solicitors, although solicitors and barristers can act for unions and can be even employed by unions. But legal representation is uh, not as a right and parties must seek permission from the Commission for a lawyer to represent them. Now, I, it doesn't say so in the textbook, but I presume that what they're getting at there is a currently registered lawyer, so a lawyer who does have a current practising certificate. I don't uh, see how you could be um, deterred from attending uh, if you had a law degree, for example, but you weren't currently practising. But in any event, a lawyer can come only when the um, uh, Fair Work Commission decides that it would enable the matter to be dealt with more efficiently, taking into account the complexity of the matter. Yeah, now, um, that sort of wanes, comes and goes a little bit, complexity, that complexity issue, because you'll also see that in QCAT sometimes, talking about um, parties can be represented if, some, if something's complex. It doesn't necessarily just mean that it's got a complex set of facts. It, it really does need to have a complex question of law which, which needs to be pulled apart and, uh, and, and examined by someone with the right skills. Um, commission can also allow a lawyer where it would be unfair not to allow representation, for example, if the person's not able to do so effectively themselves. And I think there is an example given in the notes to the Act suggesting it might be a person, for example, who had some form of uh, disability and was not able to, to uh, argue their case effectively without assistance. The um, uh, Act also says that uh, uh, it might be, uh, the Commission will allow it to occur where it would be un otherwise unfair. And again, good example given in the notes to the, to the Act that suggests that if um, the employees were represented by a well-organised union, uh, and the employer did not have uh, a HR department of their own or didn't have access to advice of their own within the business, it might be more fair to allow them to be represented as well. 
Um, interestingly, uh, and this is where a lot of community legal centres are able to offer some assistance, there's no need to apply for permission to have a lawyer help you pull your submissions together. So written submissions can be prepared by your lawyer without consent. Um, now, again, uh, an issue for what happens in courts, uh, what's the question with respect to costs? Well, the Fair Work, in the Fair Work Commission, have a look at section 611, which says generally each party pay their own costs. Each of you bear your own costs. In civil litigation, the, the rule is quite different. It's, um, the civil litigation is normally that costs follow the event. But here, if you're arguing before the Fair, Fair Work Commission, section 611 says you're each going to pay your own costs unless it's pretty clear that the proceedings were vexatious or without any reasonable cause, or um, there was never any reasonable prospect of success. Um, likewise, for cost in the, in the courts, look at section 570 of the Fair Work Act. It says that each party, again, bears their own costs. Looks sort of the same. You bear your own costs uh, unless the proceedings were vexatious or without reasonable cause. Uh, it would be uh, unreasonable in the circumstances, or um, the parties refused to cooperate in the Fair Work Commission hearing on exactly the same matter. So in other words, they had an opportunity to have this dealt with in Fair Work. They didn't. They didn't cooperate. Now it's ended up in court. Good argument in that case as to why that person should pay the costs if they're unsuccessful. Okay, now bargaining disputes we talked about in week five, so far as we talked about um, um, pulling together an enterprise agreement. So none of this is um, uh, should be unfamiliar to you. Parts 2.4 and 2.5 in the Fair Work Act talk about uh, bargaining disputes being settled by the Fair Work Commission around these issues. Majority support determination, you might remember that was where uh, the... Uh, the employees wish to bargain, but the employer uh, would would not, and uh, a majority supported the idea of um, of starting a bargaining process. Uh, a scope order where uh, the parties can't agree on who should be covered by the terms and conditions of the enterprise agreement. Um, a bargaining order where one of the parties is uh, intractable in bargaining. Remember, that allowed for things like removing one of the parties, uh, one of the, the bargaining agents and replacing them with someone else or reducing the number. And finally, a workplace determination where people just uh, ran out of patience and they asked the Fair Work Commission to decide about the terms of the uh, agreement. Uh, in Part 3.3, three, the... Uh, Fair Work Commission has given power to, again, this is in bargaining disputes, to restrain the taking of industrial action, to end the bargaining um, period, and to impose an arbitrated outcome if there's significant damage. So just revisit those uh, and remind yourself. So far as settling disputes, uh, Part 6.2, particularly Section 737, says there has to be a model term in the regulations, and that can be uh, used by the parties um, if they if they wish, um, under section uh, 738, um, the dispute settlement procedures that pull in the Fair Work Commission can be in an award or an enterprise agreement or even a contract of employment, provided the disputes about the national employment standards. In um, part 62, section 739, this is where the powers of the Fair Work um, commission to uh, to step into a dispute are a little bit curtailed. It can only happen if the term in it's jumping backwards in the term in the award in the award or the EB uh, the, sorry the enterprise agreement or the contract of employment. So only where the term requires or allows the Fair Work Commission to be involved. Fair Work Commission uh, must not exceed the powers that are given to it by that term. It can only arbitrate if authorised. And although in interesting words used in the Act, however described, so uh, the parties might have used uh, some uh, word different to the word arbitrate, uh, sort out, settle, something like that. Um, Fair Work Commission can arbitrate if it's been authorised, no matter what the, the, the words are that are used. 
So far as dispute settlement procedures are concerned, look to part 6.2, particularly section 739 of the Fair Work Act. The decision must not be inconsistent with the Act or um, an instrument, and the Fair Work Commission can only deal with the dispute on an application by a party to the dispute. So they have to be invited in, um, uh, bearing in mind the instrument itself also has to say that we'll go to fair work to have the dispute sorted out. Um, they can't, they still don't have any powers at large to, to join in. One of the parties who's a party to the dispute has to apply. More on dispute settlement procedure. In 186.6, remember when we looked at workplace agreements, we talked about whether or not. Um, the Fair Work Commission would approve a workplace agreement. There had to be a dispute clause, was one of the requirements. Um, the dispute clause has to refer those disputes to persons who are independent of the employers, the employees, or even employee organisations covered by the agreement. So in other words, you couldn't have a, um, well, you, wouldn't, you shouldn't have an enterprise agreement that's approved where the uh, dispute resolution clause talks about referring the matter, say, to the to the senior manager of the company, something like that. It has to be somebody independent. Um, and then finally, there is a model term. It's in the schedule to the regulations, um, and it talks about workplace level discussions proceeding up the chain from the supervisor. If any of you have, have had anything to do with um, dealing with uh, discrimination and inter interpersonal disputes within the workplace, you'll often see this cascading sort of provision where the dispute's first of all pushed back to something that should be dealt with by the person's supervisor, but if the supervisor's involved, then you can go a little bit further up the chain and so on and so forth. So it's that same sort of cascading thing where uh, in the first instance it's dealt with um, at the workplace level, uh, with the supervisor and then perhaps with a more senior manager, then to mediation, conciliation, and then to arbitration. So that's my comments with respect to the first part of um, Chapter 9 in the textbook. Um, and uh, in my uh, next presentation, I'll talk briefly about Part 2 in, uh, in the same uh, chapter, which deals with compliance and enforcement.